previous uh, scripture read this morning, talked about the fruit of the Spirit in scripture reading this morning, another um, agrarian um, reference is made that will be familiar to many of you, that of uh, the vine and the branches. It comes from John 15, 1 through 17. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may, may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no more, no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because the servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. And uh, there are plenty of vineyards out there. And 
Oregon wines have actually competed quite successfully in the world. Um, recently, the, the top third wine in the world is an Oregon Pinot Noir. Um, and it's, it's, it's really interesting, you know, as a person in recovery, it seems like maybe I'm a little bit more sensitive to that than other people, because I don't, I don't really like wine. I don't like hearing about wine all the time. And often at seminary and places like that, it seems like that's all people ever talk about. I kind of wonder if there's a bunch of closet alcoholics in seminary sometimes. But I get, I get a little sick of that, and it's because, you know, Portland, you, you wouldn't, you, unless you live in Portland, you wouldn't have to drive very far to see a vineyard. But I think nothing can make you want to jump the fence more than just seeing the fruit of a vineyard, just to look out and see all these grapes glistening like rubies in the sun. Nothing kind of makes you want to, it just makes your mouth water like that. It takes a lot of work and a lot of time to produce fruit like that, like you see behind me. It's not the sort of farming that can be done from a detached nature like a a GPS, you know, that pretty much just drives the tractor for you. I mean, a vineyard is not that sort of farming. It takes a person walking in the rows every day, looking at how the leaves and the fruits are doing, constantly um, pruning gently with thumbnail, knocking off little shoots that come, manicuring the vines every day so that they would produce the most glorious fruit that they can. Picture God as the, the Father, as the vine dresser of all things, actually a profoundly beautiful image of God for me. It's every bit as meaningful to me as thinking of God as my Father. A vineyard is something that is very intentional, just as intentional as building a family. It takes years of forethought and planning and thinking. Lots of preparatory work goes into uh, to produce a vineyard long before you'll ever see the first fruits of that labor. And there's lots of things that God does, I think, that in our world to produce the good fruits that we see. Work that we, that's behind the scenes that we never acknowledge or address or even think about. And the teaching of Jesus here is, is not quite a parable, it's not quite an allegory. But I think it packs as big a punch as either of those things could. And a thousand years of looking at this passage and thinking about it, I don't know that you wouldn't just continue to mine new truths and deep meaning about the nature of who God is and the nature of, of our, uh, our connectedness to God. Quakers especially seem to love John, and this passage especially is where we get our name as the religious society of friends. We strive to be the people that Jesus would, would uh, look to as his friends, the people who do what God commands. And this beautiful imagery of God the Father um, is something that could just stick with you if you if you think about it, look at it, because the the, the vine dresser is is a, is a noble work, something that God does, and being connected to Jesus like a branch is to a vine is something that is profoundly beautiful. So vines uh, put down roots and they take up nutrients from the soil and they, they bring water to the, the fruit and they hold up the leaves that feed the plant. And all these resources pass through the branches into the fruit that is produced, the glorious grapes that we see. And God is the vine dresser, the source of the vine. His is the hand that manicures and curates the vine. Jesus, the, the conduit of our connection with the Father. And our lives are the branches, and our lives are designed to bear fruit. We read uh, about Paul's words to the Galatians about the fruits of the Spirit. It's easy to think about these things. Joy, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. These are the fruits that grow within us, but there's fruits that grow outside of us too. The fruits of being a witness, the fruits of reaching out into our world with the love of God. The world that Scripture tells us is one that is appointed by God. Jesus is the vine, and apart from him, we only have the illusion of life. Apart from him, we stand cut off, perishing and not even maybe realizing it, slowly drying out from our lack of sustenance. A great modern parallel, maybe, of what John is describing for his audience is, is like an electrical cord. If it's plugged into the wall, it's alive. You know, it'll turn a motor. It can be of use. But if you unplug that, it, it, it quickly fades. 
if we're not plugged into Jesus, our lives start to fade out. We start to lose our connection. We start to lose the purposes that we have. Just like when you yank an electrical cord and there's that little light that starts to just fade right away. There's that little last vestiges of power in the, in the line that, that burn itself out. Instantly. That's how we are spiritually when we are disconnected from God. We're not in intimate connection and communion with Him. In this biblical metaphor, we're literally grown into Jesus. We're like Him in our own way, just like smaller conduits of the love of God working in our lives and the bearing the fruit that God calls us to bear. The Greek word here uh, for remain or abide is, is meno. And remain seems almost like a negative word in our society. We kind of think about remain like we think about leftovers or things that stand behind after everything else is gone. But abide is a word that we don't really use very often in our society, in our culture, but I think it's a profoundly meaningful word. It speaks kind of a, a grown-in, um, uh, developed relationship. An abode is a dwelling, and to abide is to dwell. We dwell in God. We dwell with Jesus in this holy habitation. And our job is to remain and be nourished and allow God's words to remain in us, to embrace life, to be changed, to let God have his way in us so completely that our lives bear fruit, that explode out of, in, of that relationship that we're uh, in, in touch with God through. And it's, it sounds pretty good, I think, to, to think about the fruitful side, think about bearing fruits in our life. But we have to do a lot of work to let God do that. We have to do that work of letting, letting God do his work in us. We have to trust God enough to let him shape us. And Jesus is the vine, but he's also, in a sense, the vine dresser. And he's pruning us. He's pruning us, and it's a, a trial that we must endure to bear fruit for God. And pruning hurts, you know, by definition, it is to be reduced and simplified. Life can grow a lot of different directions at once, but it takes God working on our lives to, to dip some of these things in the bud we could produce the fruit that will last. And the finest fruits are the fruits that get the resources that come through fine. Sometimes that means that we'll experience loss or separation. Sometimes it means that we're not going to get our way or we might be very attached to these things that are growing in our life that God takes his little thumbnail and scrapes off here and there. This person from the other side of the tracks, I've seen God prune some pretty big things out of my life. It's like God took a chainsaw almost and cut away these massive things out of my life that were le leeching all the spiritual resources away from what God was doing, what God wanted to do in my heart. That massive things cut off my life like relationships, uh, job opportunities, materialism. You know, uh, it's, it's to be in a relationship with God, to be intimately connected with God is to be changed. It's to give God permission to meddle in our lives. And some of these thick branches that we have that are, are really dead branches, siphoning things off, not really being used to produce the fruits that God has for us. There are places in our lives where we're kind of dying on the vine. And I felt that, uh, that to be connected with God was something that I really wanted, that it was worth the work, it was worth enduring the trial of being changed by God. But don't let anyone fool you that when you come into the spiritual life, that your life's just going to be full of blessings, that you're always going to get your way, that God's not going to prune anything out of your life, that you won't be challenged, that the Christian faith is all about comfort and security. You won't experience the little thumbnail of God scraping off something from your life here or there. That you won't experience the no of God. But the faithfulness and abundance God can bring into our lives requires a sort of sacrifice. Ever see those giant pumpkins at the state fair? How they get those pumpkins at the state fair is through pruning. They basically take a vine that's really big and long and they cut off all the little shoots that would go off of it. So all the resources that would go into 40 or 50 pumpkins only goes into one. You know, in, in Oregon we have these uh, orchards all over the place and through pruning you can have a, a case in which an orchard is so fruitful they actually have to take two by fours out and prop up the branches so the weight of the fruit doesn't rip the whole branch right off the tree. 
takes trust and sacrifice to be fruitful, to remain, to bear fruit, to be made clean. It takes sacrifice to remain in God's love, to soak it up and let it work in every corner of our lives. But God isn't the only one whose actions affects our, affect our lives. As we remain connected to God, we find that these fruits still require something of us. They require obedience to God. They require us to grow not only internally, but externally. We find the relationship between what God is doing in us and what he wants to do through us. We find as we take God's word into us that we sacrifice in new ways like keeping God's commands. As the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control grow in us, they can't just stay in us. Love we receive and love we give. Joy in our hearts becomes joy shared with the world. Peace within us calls us to look at the, the world of justice at work in the world. Kindness and goodness and faithfulness are things that burst out from our lives into the world, into the relationships we have with other people. And even self-control, the one that maybe we fight against the most, comes to, uh, as we learn to limit ourselves for the sake of human relationships, we learn to limit ourselves uh, that our love would be even more fruitful. Jesus said that the greatest command was really two commands, to love God and love others. And these things are two sides of the same coin, they're that connected. As we grow, we cannot find that we have a private relationship with God that can't burst forth into the world. We have love that has to come out into our actions, into our lives. We can't just have beliefs that stick up in our minds and don't work themselves out into action. So um, as we wrestle with this mysterious Jesus, this person who comes to us as a vine, we, we recognize that we can't just put Jesus in a box. We can know all kinds of things about Jesus. We can know Greek and Hebrew and theology and all these things. But if we don't have that kind of relationship with God where we're grown into him, where we know him personally and deeply, you know, where we know what it means for him to be the vine of our lives. If we don't have that, we don't have anything. Jesus says that he is the vine. He offers us an abundant life, an eternal life with him. And he offers more than just life with him. He offers to be uh, uh, us a life in him. He offers a deep connection that, that's so deep that we're grown together, fused together. He offers us a home, a holy habitation with him where we will dwell with him and live with him and be in him. And it's space enough that we can be honest with who we really are, as comfortable as him as, as, we, as we might be sitting in our own living room, resting. The relationship with Jesus should be something that's personal, but it should be something that's vibrant, something that's sustaining. It should bear fruit that will last. And so keeping God's commands, obedience, and being pruned are things that are difficult to accept. And without a deep connection, without an enduring trust, without a commitment to being a conduit of God's love, these things will always be things that make the little hairs on the back of our neck stand up, those words like obedience. But if, there, uh, if we have a real relationship with God, we recognize that these things are the flip side to that. They're the natural consequences of being connected to this vine that sustains us. Of God being the one who prunes us. And of us making a decision that we want to live lives of abundance. So it's God who brings the fruit, and we're the ones that bear it. We're the ones who choose to abide in Christ, to remain in his teachings, to walk in obedience as his friends. But note this, change is inevitable. To live is to change. To know God is to be changed. The only branch that doesn't change is a branch that's been cut off. It's laying on the ground, not, not realizing that it's dying. It may look good for a while, it might even be green, but there's no longer any life in it. And so our job is to remain connected, to keep trusting God, to simply celebrate and be grateful for the fruit that's in our lives. But don't be afraid, God offers us far more than we ever thought was possible. He walks around pruning as the vine dresser, cutting off the dead ends of our lives. And he offers us a frightful beauty and wonder and spiritual fruit that our lives
Christ we bear. He offers us himself. To share a part of him so close that we're like one. It's like we're dancing with God sometimes. If we really embrace this image, it's almost like we could be so comfortable with God that it'd be like dancing in the living room of our own house. And so God offers this to you. He offers you a relationship of connection that deep. And if there's something stopping that, God might be scraping a little bit at your life. So as we go into our time of open worship, I just wanted you to think about that. Think about the things that God might be pruning from your life. Things that God might be doing that hurt, but that bear fruit. And just be grateful for the fruit that you see as God has been working in your life this far.